At that time, I was only 24. My life was even then gloomy, ill-regulated and as solitary as that of a savage. I made friends with no one and positively avoided talking, and buried myself more and more in my hole. At work in the office, I never looked at anyone, and was perfectly well aware that my companions looked upon me, not only as a queer fellow, but even looked upon me, I always fancied this, with a sort of loathing. I sometimes wondered why it was that nobody except me fancied that he was looked upon with aversion. One of the clerks had a most repulsive, pocked-marked face, which looked positively villainous. I believe I should not have dared to look at anyone with such an unsightly countenance. Another had such a very dirty old uniform that there was an unpleasant odour in his proximity. Yet not one of these gentlemen showed the slightest self-consciousness either about their clothes or their countenance, or their character in any way. Neither of them ever imagined that they were looked at with repulsion. If they had imagined it, they would not have minded so long as their superiors did not look at them in that way. It is clear to me now that, owing to my unbounded vanity and to the high standard I set for myself, I often looked at myself with furious discontent, which verged on loathing and so I inwardly attributed the same feeling to everyone. I hated my face. For instance, I thought it disgusting and even suspected that there was something base in my expression. And so every day when I turned up at the office, I tried to behave as independently as possible, and to assume a lofty expression, so that I might not be suspected of being abject. My face may be ugly, I thought, but let it be lofty, expressive and above all extremely intelligent. But I was positively and painfully certain that it was impossible for my countenance ever to express those qualities. And what was worst of all, I thought it actually stupid looking. And I would have been quite satisfied if I could have looked intelligent. In fact, I would even have put up with looking base if, at the same time, my face could have been thought strikingly intelligent. Of course, I hated my fellow clerks, one and all, and I despised them all, yet at the same time I was, as it were, afraid of them. In fact, it happened at times that I thought more highly of them than of myself. It somehow happened quite suddenly that I alternated between despising them and thinking them superior to myself. A cultivated and decent man, cannot be vain without setting a fearfully high standard for himself and without despising and almost hating himself at certain moments. But whether I despised them or thought them superior, I dropped my eyes almost every time I met anyone. I even made experiments whether I could face so and so's looking at me, and I was always the first to drop my eyes. This worried me to destruction. I had sickly dread, too, of being ridiculous, and so had a slavish passion for the conventional in everything external. I loved to fall into the common rat, and had a wholehearted terror of any kind of eccentricity in myself. But how could I live up to it? I was morbidly sensitive as a man of our age should be. They were all stupid, and as like one another as so many sheep. Perhaps I was the only one in the office who fancied that I was a coward and a slave, and I fancied it just because I was more highly developed. But it was not only that I fancied it, it really was so. I was a crowd and a slave. I say this without the slightest embarrassment. Every decent man of our age must be a coward and a slave, that he is normal, that is his normal condition, 
of that I am firmly persuaded. He is made and constructed to that very end, and not only at the present time owing to some casual circumstances, but always, at all times, a decent man is bound to be a coward and slave. It is the law of nature for all decent people all over the earth. If any one of them happens to be valiant about something, he need not be comforted nor carried away by that. He would show the white feather just the same before something else. That is how it invariably and inevitably ends. Only donkeys and mules are valiant, and they only till they are pushed up to the wall. It is not worth while to pay attention to them for they really are of no consequence. Another circumstance, too, worried me in those days, that there was no one like me, and I was unlike anyone else. I am alone and they are everyone, I thought and pondered. From that it is evident that I was still a youngster. The very opposite sometimes happened. It was loathsome sometimes to go to the office. Things reached such a point that I often came home ill, but all at once, a propose of nothing. There would come a phase of skepticism and indifference. Everything happened in phases to me, and I would laugh myself at my intolerance and fastidiousness. I would reproach myself with being romantic. At one time I was unwilling to speak to anyone, while at other times, I would not only talk, but go to the length of contemplating making friends with them. All my fastidiousness would suddenly, for no rhyme or reason, vanish. Who knows, perhaps I never had really had it, and it had simply been affected and got out of books. I have not decided that question even now, once I quite made friends with them, visited their homes played preference, drank vodka, talked of promotions. But he let me make a digression. We Russians, speaking generally, have never had those foolish transcendental romantics, German, and still more, French, on whom nothing produces any effect. If there were an earthquake, if all France perished at the barricades, they would still be the same they would not even have the decency to affect a change, but would still go on singing their transcendental songs to the hour of their death, because they are fools. We, in Russia, have no fools, that is well known, that is what distinguishes us from foreign lands. Consequently, these transcendental natures are not found amongst us in their pure form, the characteristics of our romantics are absolutely and directly opposed to the transcendental European type, and no European standard can be applied to them. Allow me to make use of this word, romantic, an old-fashioned and much-respected word which has done good service and is familiar to all. The characteristics of our romantic are to understand everything to see everything and to see it often incomparably more clearly than our most realistic minds see it, to refuse to accept anyone or anything, but at the same time not to despise anything, to give way, to yield from policy, never to lose sight of a useful practical object, such as rent-free quarters at the government expense, pensions, decorations, to keep their eye on their object through all the enthusiasms and the volumes of lyrical poems, and at the same time to preserve the sublime and the beautiful inviolate within them to the hour of their death, and to preserve themselves also, incidentally like some precious jewel wrapped in cotton wool if only for the benefit of the sublime and the beautiful. Our romantic is a man of great breath and the greatest rogue of all our rogues. I assure you, 
I can assure you from experience, indeed. Of course, that is, if he is intelligent. But what am I saying? The romantic is always intelligent, and I only meant to observe that although we have had foolish romantics, they don't count. And they were only so because in the flower of their youth, they were degenerated into Germans and to preserve their precious jewel more comfortably settled somewhere out there. I, for instance, genuinely despised my official work and did not openly abuse it simply because I was in it myself and got a salary for it. Anyway, take note, I did not openly abuse it. Our romantic would rather go out of his mind, a thing, however, which very rarely happens, then take to open abuse, unless he had some other career in view. And he is never kicked out. At most, they would take him to the lunatic asylum as the king of Spain, if he should go very mad. But it is only the thin, fair people who go out of their minds in Russia. Innumerable romantics attain later in life to considerable rank in the service. Their many-sidedness is remarkable, and what a faculty they have for the most contradictory sensations. I was comforted by this thought even in those days, and I am of the same opinion now. That is why there are so many broad natures among us who never lose their ideal even in the depths of degradation. And although they never stir finger for their ideal, though they are errant thieves and knaves, yet they cheerfully cherish their first ideal and are extraordinarily honest at heart. Yes, it is only among us that the most incorrigible rogue can be absolutely and loftily honest at heart without in the least ceasing to be rogue. I repeat, our romantics frequently become such accomplished rascals, I use the term rascals affectionately, suddenly display such a sense of reality and practical knowledge that their bewildered superiors and the public generally can only ejaculate in amazement. Their many-sidedness is really amazing, and goodness knows what it may develop into later on, and what the future has in store for us. It is not a poor material. I do not say this from any foolish or boastful patriotism, but I feel sure that you are again imagining that I am joking, or perhaps it's just the contrary and you are convinced that I really think so. Anyway, gentlemen, I shall welcome both views as an honor and a special favor, and do forgive my digression. I did not, of course, maintain friendly relations with my comrades and soon was at loggerheads with them. And in my youth and inexperience, I even gave up bowing to them, as though I had cut off all relations. That, however, only happened to me once. As a rule, I was always alone. In the first place, I spent most of my time at home reading. I tried to stifle all that was continually seething within me by means of external impressions, and the only external means I had was reading. Reading, of course, was a great help, exciting me, giving me pleasure and pain, but at times it bored me fearfully. One lunged for moments in spite of everything, and I plunged all at once into dark, underground, loathsome vice of the pettiest kind. My wretched passions were acute, smarting from my continual sickly irritability I had hysterical impulses, with tears and convulsions. I had no resource except reading, that is, there was nothing in my surroundings which I could respect and which attracted me. I was overwhelmed with depression too. I had a hysterical craving for incongruity and for contrast, and so I took to vice. I have not said all this to justify myself, but no, I am lying. 
I did want to justify myself. I make that little observation for my own benefit, gentlemen. I don't want to lie. I vowed to myself I would not. And so furtively, timidly, in solitude at night, I indulged in filthy vice with a feeling of shame which never deserted me, even at the most loathsome moments, and which at such moments nearly made me curse. Already even then I had my underground world in my soul. I was fearfully afraid of being seen, of being met, of being recognized. I visited various obscure haunts. From Fyodor Dostoevsky's Notes from the Underground Narrated by A.C.